You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Ballmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any reason. Hi, I'm Kevin Bulmer. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for finding the show. I hope you enjoy it. Today, we're going to explore the journey of Steve Zanella. Now, Steve helps people learn to overcome anxiety, stress, and fear with meditation, mindfulness, and love. As he says, he's just sharing his story. Now, he's here to tell his story his way. I'll give you some of the highlights, though, to give you a little bit of context as to what's coming up. In Steve's words, as a kid, he was like every other kid growing up, except for the fact that he suffered from an anxiety disorder and from panic attacks. If you've ever had one of those, you'll know that's an awful situation, especially when they're repeating themselves. He spent most of his childhood feeling nervous and afraid. As a teenager, things only got worse. Steve says that by the time he hit 30, he was mentally and physically unhealthy. He was having daily panic attacks at work, anxiety about going out with friends and visiting family, and the fear of someone finding out what he called his secret caused him to really kind of close off to the rest of the world. He said he avoided any situations where he thought it might cause anxiety to spike. And then what it led to was when he couldn't avoid a situation like that, he would self-medicate with alcohol. By his mid-30s, he found himself divorced with two kids, three jobs, broke and broken. He says he went then on a journey to understand his anxiety, and eventually it led him to one simple truth, and that was that the anxiety doesn't have to be a life sentence. I'm going to hold here for just a moment because I'm absolutely certain that this podcast is going to find its way into the ears of some people that are struggling. I've been where Steve is to at least my own version of it, and I've had panic attacks. I remember big, big stretches of my life where just everything felt like it wasn't going to be okay. was on several different anti-anxiety or anti-depression medications, and when I think about where I am now versus where I was, I'm astounded. But to that point that Steve has made about understanding that it doesn't have to be a life sentence... I can understand in my own way, and I'm absolutely sure that Steve has can, that if you're listening to this right now and you're struggling and it feels like to everybody else the sky is blue, but for you it's purple or some other color, I know that's a really, really difficult place. But it is doable to be able to start taking those little steps and start moving forward from that and finding a better place. And so I'd really like for you to just... Open your mind up and relax and listen to Steve tell his story and understand that you're going to hear it. I'll call him on this a couple of times. You're going to hear the 2017 version of him, not the one that was having all of those challenges that he described, but just understand that all those challenges were there and he was able to change. From the time that he chose to start moving forward, he describes the next few years as some of the most amazing of his life. He learned how to love and how to be kind to himself. He says he began to love his life and see the world from a completely new perspective. He says that change didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. Steve is now married with three amazing children. He learned the secret to dealing with his anxiety and panic attacks, put his life back together, and couldn't be happier with the results. As he says, he went from being afraid to leave his house to actually standing on stage sharing his story with the world. He knows that if he can do it, you can do it. And he's going to be a great example for people to follow of learning how to live a life free from anxiety. It's interesting to me that Steve would come along along my path at this particular time. Now, we recorded the conversation that you're about to hear a couple of weeks from the time that I'm actually recording this. And in the time since, I ended up for the last 10 days or so, I just haven't been feeling well. For as long a stretch as I can remember in the last year or more. And it's really frustrated me because one of the things that I've realized is that when you're physically unwell, you push yourself too hard. 
and your body starts to break down on you a little bit, number one, there are some signs that maybe you're not paying attention to or lessons that you need to learn. And in my case, I've been thinking a lot about that. (laughs) Okay, I'm getting some signs here. There's some things I'm not paying attention to, some lessons I need to learn. But the other thing that's happened to me over the last seven to 10 days in the time since Steve and I talked is that when my body started breaking down, my mind went with it. And I have worked and do work so hard to cultivate and maintain a positive mindset and frame of mind and state of being and and good energy level and vibration. And it just, it seemed like it went away the snap of a finger. And I went through parts of the last week or so as I was preparing for this podcast and to share the conversation you're about to hear with Steve, just astounded at how quickly my thoughts could be negative again. But even though that was happening, the key, at least for me at this point in my journey, was being able to recognize those are just thoughts. They're not me. They're not necessarily representative of reality. Doesn't make them comfortable, but it also doesn't make them real. And then so part of lopping on top of this cold or flu or whatever it is that I've been battling and some of these negative thoughts come racing in, then there's this discomfort of sort of fighting against yourself, except that when you realize that that's what you're doing, there's progress. When you can realize that the thoughts are just thoughts and that you actually get to choose whether you want to try to push them back out the door or not and reprogram yourself for positive thoughts, that's progress. And it's taken me years to get to this point. So am I saying that I'm happy that I'm having negative thoughts? <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. But it's important to understand that I don't think there's any one magic button that you can push that just makes everything roses and rainbows for the rest of your lives. We're all going to have times where we hit those patches where you're going to need to be able to put some of those tools into play to really understand, okay, what's going on here? And that's why I think awareness is such a huge, huge key factor. But you're going to learn a lot from Steve coming up here in just a second. Some of the key points that I took away from my conversation with Steve, number one, changing your why. So you're going to hear Steve talk about some of the reasons that he was giving himself why he wanted to change and try to get control of his anxiety. But what ended up happening was his daughter came along and that changed everything for him. And not necessarily in the way that you might think it would just by hearing, oh, you have a kid and then everything is love and wonderful and it gives your life meaning and all those things are true. But I love the way that Steve recognized this situation about the love that he felt for his newborn daughter, but not necessarily for himself. And the questions that he began to ask as a result of that, it changed his why. Listen for that. It's such a powerful story. Key point number two, I'm going to call asking why. I love what Steve shared about adopting the practice of approaching everything like a toddler. And if you've ever had a toddler in the house, you know that it can be <laughs> it can be a challenge because everything is a question. Why? 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 Well, sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge in terms of your overall state of stress and peace of mind when you've got a toddler actually challenging challenging you all the time and no amount of answers will satisfy the quench for more knowledge or the thirst for no, more knowledge or won't quench that thirst. You know what I mean. But when it comes to yourself and why or when you're looking into what you're feeling or why you're thinking the way that you're thinking or feeling the way that you're thinking about something, to continue to ask why and to peel those layers away is a really valuable skill. And so I had never heard anybody put it quite the way that Steve did about approaching everything like a toddler would and just continuing to ask why. So have a listen for that. And the other thing, and if you don't take anything else away from this conversation with Steve, take this away of how he talks about the idea that you can teach yourself anything. The knowledge is out there. You won't necessarily get the degree, but the knowledge is free. It's just up to you to go after it and to do the work to get it. Steve makes a great point about that you can go to the library. If you've got access to the internet, which if you don't, you can actually go and get that at the library. You can get access to Google. You can probably go see a counselor or a therapist, but even if you can't do that, One of the reasons why I love libraries so much is that it's just 
in a, a place filled with knowledge that you can just pull off the shelves for nothing other than your time and being curious to go in and open a, a book up and open your mind up and start to learn things. And so I love what, what Steve has to share about this, that you can teach yourself how to do anything up to and including freeing yourself from anxiety and learning how to live in a state that's a lot more happy, but you've got to be willing to do the work. A couple other notes real quick before we get into the conversation. A couple of Seinfeld references, which I understand are getting more and more dated by the day. But it was a popular TV show in the 90s. It's one of the last shows that I actually watched and really enjoyed on a regular basis. A couple of Seinfeld references come up. One that Steve initiated and one <laughs> at the very end that I initiated that landed like a lead balloon because I thought he would know what I meant and he didn't. And so that's why on the blog post, the show notes for this, which is episode 45 with Steve Zanella, I've got a couple of YouTube clips from Seinfeld up there so that I can, uh, <laughs> so that people can understand what we're talking about if they haven't seen it or for some clarity, even for those who have like Steve, um, even though I mentioned he's seen it and I mentioned the one uh, situation that, well, Let's just say it. I went for it, and it was a bit of a swing and a miss. So listen for that at the end. Here's my conversation with Steve Zanella on the No Schedule Man podcast. Steve, what was the first thing that you remember doing as a means of pushing back at the anxiety and a means of reclaiming your well-being? Wow, that's that's a big question. Um, when it comes to my anxiety, it started off really small from a pushing back standpoint. When you live with the level of anxiety and fear and worry that I did for the majority of my life, things that most people take for granted doing every day are acts of courage for people struggling with an anxiety disorder. Um, the big thing for me, I think where it really started from a doing something publicly started off with my social media. When I really started to gain control of my life and, and put the pieces back together after having everything pretty much fall apart, I wanted to be a more positive person. And the idea of being the change you want to see in the world, there seemed to be a lot of anxiety and negativity around me. So I decided that I was going to focus on positivity. So one of the first things that I started doing was I, I made a, a deal with myself that anything that I was going to put out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, anything like that was going to be positive. I was always the type of person that was kind of sarcastic. I'd complain about my day, but try to do it in a funny way. But it was still complaining. It was still negativity. So I started really putting messages out there that I thought were beneficial to other people and, and also to myself. And that was difficult for me because it was the first time where I was stepping outside of what I thought other people expected from me. And that was sort of an anxiety trigger. You know, when you, when you have anxiety and you worry about what other people think about you, you're constantly trying to match your assumption of their expectation. So I started putting these positive messages out there. And surprisingly enough, some of the first feedback that I got was, was slightly on the negative side. I think when you start to become more positive, it takes people off guard. You know, I had friends who started reaching out and they were asking me questions like, you know, what do you smoke in there? You know, <laughs> what's going on? What's, what's with the change? What's going on? And, and I just kind of, I tried to, again, stay very positive and smile through it and say, you know, I'm just trying to find the, you know, the bright side and everything and, and just putting out some positivity. And I just continued on and continued on. And, and after about six months or so, I started to get direct messages from friends who were saying, you know, just wanted to let you know that I really enjoy reading your positive posts and keep it up. Hmm. And over the past couple of years, in meeting and, and seeing friends and family face to face, I oftentimes get that, 
that same, you know, I love reading your Facebook posts. They're so inspirational, you know, keep it up. I really, you know, it makes me smile. It makes me laugh. And, and that was really the first time I started putting something out there that scared me. And it may seem strange to think that being positive is something that someone would be scared of, but it was really just being something other than what I thought other people wanted me to be. These things that you're describing, Steve, these are, in my view, heroic acts for someone that is so awash in what I'll call anxiety. There had to have been some little buds that popped up out of the ground well prior to that. Something simpler, something that, like somebody turned a lamp on in the corner in a dark room that made you even acknowledge this has got a hold of me. I'm going to try to make a choice to turn this tide. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about those moments? Well, I can tell you that the first moment where I really took a long, hard look at at myself and my anxiety and, and the fear that I struggled with was 10 years ago when my daughter, Lillianne, was born. I was so excited to be a dad for millions of different reasons. It was something that I had been building up in my life, and, and I'd have to go even further back. You know, the idea of you, you create this picture of all these things that you think you're supposed to accomplish or do this, you know, this checklist of just do these things and I'll be happy. And I had done them and I wasn't happy. So I thought, well, there must be some something else I need to do. And once I do that, then I'll be happy. So ha- having a family and having my own children was one of those things that I thought was going to make me happy. And in many ways, it absolutely did. When my daughter was born, I was completely e- ecstatic. It was, you know, one of the best days of my life. But then shortly thereafter, I started to I started to worry a little bit about the fact that, you know, I had this anxiety. I had all of these issues that I knew deep down inside I hadn't dealt with and I didn't know how to deal with them. And in looking at my daughter and seeing how perfect she was to me, I wanted to be a great dad to her. And I didn't know if I could do that suffering from the anxiety that I had and the issues that I had. And, and also I thought about what if she had the same anxiety? What if she developed the same anxiety problems that I had suffered with my entire life? Cause my anxiety went all the way back to my childhood and it, you know, anxiety is one of those things where it becomes habitual and you actually practice and make yourself more anxious about things. So I worried, what if my daughter has anxiety? How would I, as her father, help her? And it, and it changed the perspective that I had on absolutely everything, going all the way back to my childhood. And a lot of my anxiety came from, you know, dealing with my parents and and my parents got divorced when I was very young. And there was a lot of pain and there was a lot of emotional issues that went along with with my childhood that sort of gave birth to my anxiety. And when I looked at her, I just I wanted to be able to help her. And I knew that I couldn't if I couldn't help myself. So my first steps in starting to overcome my anxiety was to really take a long, hard look at myself but for her, she became my, my daughter became my why. And that became the driving force behind me being willing and finding that courage to step forward and to start really challenging myself and, and taking that long, hard look in the mirror. And, you know, when you look at things like fear, I truly believe that In order for you to start to overcome a fear, your passion has to be stronger than your fear. Your why has to be stronger than the fear that you have. 
And up until that point, nothing was stronger than my fear. But the love that I had for my daughter was the first time I experienced something that was actually stronger than my fear. I, I couldn't do it for myself, but I could do it for her. I'm wondering how much you alluded to this just a little bit, but as your daughter began to grow and no doubt your relationship with her deepened as you were doing this work, how much you became reflective of yourself and the part of you that was sort of as a child it's just kind of reflecting back to you through her experience. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, my perspective completely shifted when I became a parent because I started looking at my life very differently, but then I started looking at it through the lens of my parents. So I started seeing how I felt towards her, and it started raising the question, did my parents feel this way towards me? Hmm. So what ended up happening was my perspective completely changed to a point where I started, I, I sort of became my own parent. I started parenting myself, parenting sort of that, that inner child, so to speak. The voice that a lot of the anxiety that I had was that negative, what if questioning in the back of my head. And a lot of that voice what it was my parents from from growing up and and a lot of the issues that that we went through and a lot of the struggles that we had and it, i it shifted my perspective when i had a daughter because when i looked at her i knew how i felt and i knew that no matter what she did she would never i would never not love her unconditionally she could never be less than perfect to me And then I started to flip that and say, you know, was I ever that perfect? And what did I do that caused me to no longer be this perfect? So it really changed how I started looking at myself. And a lot of people, when they struggle with anxiety, what what they find when they really start going deep is that they realize that their relationship with themselves is damaged. And I needed to love myself the same way that I loved my daughter. And I didn't, I completely hated who I was. And when I started, so I started doing this little practice where every time I would think about a situation that would start to cause anxiety in me or something that I would worry about, something that I thought I might fail or or do poorly at, I would picture my daughter and I would imagine that she was coming and speaking to me coming to me with that same problem or that same fear or concern. And I would think about what I would say to her. But more importantly, I would feel the love that I had for her while I was giving her that advice. Because I truly believed when I said, you know, in my mind, if I would tell her, you know, everyone fails, it, it's all right. I believed that when I imagined I was telling it to her, but I didn't believe it when it was directed towards myself. So I started using the picture of my daughter and then redirecting that towards myself and saying, if my daughter is this amazing person, I could also be that amazing person. And if I have this much love and support for her, I can have that much love and support for myself. We've jumped off. I've jumped us off kind of in the middle of the story. (laughs) I want to go back closer to the beginning. Sure. Tell me if you would, Steve, about some of the happy remembrances that you have from your time when you were a kid. What were some of the things that you remember really enjoying? Some of the things that I really enjoyed, um, I lived, we, well, my parents got divorced when I was very young. And a lot of the, a lot of the memories that I have from my childhood are, are, are still pretty painful or at least were very painful for a long time. After shortly after my parents divorced, uh, my mom bought a house on a lake, and I loved that house. I loved that it was on a dead end street, and we lived on the lake side of the street. And I had friends that lived up and down the street, and we would go we would go swimming in the summer all the time. We would literally jump in the lake and swim a couple houses down, and then come up and knock on the back door and get a friend, and then 
you know, we'd jump in the lake and swim to the next person's house. I was outdoors all the time. I really enjoyed being with friends. There was a lot of, you know, I mean, it was a very different time than it is today. I'm going to sound like that, you know, old, you know, back when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we were outside. We, we, from the moment the sun came up, when it got dark, we went home and got flashlights and went right back outside. <laughs> you know, we were outside all the time. I used to love going fishing. We, you know, a couple of my friends had, had rowboats and we'd take it out around the lake. And I spent, you know, the, ch- the childhood years that I lived in that house outside on the lake in nature and those were probably my happiest times what did you think that was ahead of you you know when a kid dreams about what they think life is going to entail what they want to be as you got into your teenage years and a little bit beyond that what were you thinking about in that regard well i'll be honest i i wasn't thinking of much I, as a teenager, my anxiety started to really amp up Hmm. and I really struggled. I mean, my, my anxiety started the first, I can tell you the first time I remember being really anxious, I was three. It was one of my earliest memories and it was, my parents were fighting. They were, they were having an argument in the house and my, my father was actually outside the front door. My mother had locked him out of the house and they were arguing, yelling back and forth through the door. And at some point while they were arguing, my father started calling to me and he said, you know, Stephen, open the door. It's your father. Let me in. And my mother turned and said, Stephen, don't open that door. Now, my father wasn't a, wasn't a violent man by any nature. And they were, you know, adults fight, they argue, but at three years old, your parents are your your universe. You know, they are the two people that mean the absolute most to you. And here I was being put in a situation where half of my world was telling me to do the exact opposite of my other half of the world, you know? So I I remember feeling this sense of of anxiety and fear and and I I didn't know what to do. And it sort of set this level of, you know, choice was a bad thing. Choice became a, a four-letter word to me. So as I started to get older and become a teenager, trying to figure out what I wanted to do was would produce anxiety because I had this in the back of my head that any choice I made was wrong. You know, I couldn't think about what the solution was enough. There was never it was sort of that analysis paralysis. I would just go over all the options over in my head. And I couldn't, I couldn't make a decision. So as a teenager, I had no plans. I mean, I got into high school and I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no goals. You know, I figured I'd graduate from high school and probably go pump gas. I was, my anxiety kept me from wanting to go to college. I was halfway through my senior year. I hadn't taken any SATs. I hadn't done anything to prepare to go on to college. And it was actually my high school art teacher. He pulled me aside. I was very, I was always a very creative kid. And this is something that you find with people who struggle with anxiety disorders. They're very creative. I mean, we can come up with the most in-depth things to be afraid of. Our minds are completely crazy and we can create the, the most terrifying things to ourselves. So I always, I got involved with art at a very young age You know, I, I was one of those, yeah, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning and I'd come downstairs and I'd turn on the TV and there was a, there was an old show here in, in New England that would run, uh, when I was a child called, uh, drawing with captain Bob. And it was this old sailor guy and he would draw pictures and you could draw along with him and you teach you how to draw cats and, and different, different things. And I would get up and I would draw with him every morning. And I love doing that. And all through high school, it was the only that creative expression was the only way that I could express myself is the only way I could I could get things out. And halfway through my senior year, my art teacher, uh, Bruce Dean was his name. He pulled me aside and he said, so what are you going to do? And I said, I, I have no plans. And he said, if you don't go on and do something, it's going to be a huge waste of talent. So he pushed me to go 
He said there's a two-year college. It's close. You can commute. If you're, if you're not sure if four years of college is right for you, you can do two years. At least you'll have an associate's degree. They have a great art program. You can still get in. And I literally, this was like the middle of the week. They were having SATs that weekend. And I signed up and I went and I took the SATs and I applied and got in and I went there for two years. But even coming out of that, I had no idea what I was going to do. You know, I came out and I, I worked odd jobs. You know, I worked as a janitor. I was scrubbing toilets at a retail store. I was delivering pizzas. I, I was completely unfocused, mostly because my anxiety kept telling me I couldn't do any of these things. You know, I, I, I didn't have the ability. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. You know, anything that I tried to do, I would probably fail. And it, you know, it, it really held me back from pushing myself and trying to become everything that I could have been. And that was a, that was a challenge. I'm assuming that you're married. Um, or I, were? Am, I am remarried. Okay. I am remarried right now. Well, you're, um, you're a little bit ahead in the game than I am. I've been through one and <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to make light of it. I'm not trying to be glib for people that are listening. Um, the reason why I'm asking is I'm curious about when the relationship that became your first marriage sh first showed up in your life and what was going on at that time. Well, um, I met my first wife when we were – she was in college. I was also in college. We didn't go to the same school. We met through a mutual friend. And – you know, we we fell in love early and we were both around 18 and we didn't really know who we were, let alone who we wanted to be in the future or what type of relationship we wanted to eventually have. And because of, you know, because of my anxiety, I I I was the type of person who. So so I'll back up a little bit and say. Because of the issues, because of going through the, the divorce with with my parents and growing up in that environment where I was, you know, I would visit my dad every other weekend and, you know, there was a lot of pain associated with that. I got it in my head that I needed to get married and have kids so that I could fix that pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I created this scenario where the only way I could fix my childhood would be to recreate it and do it right. I'd get married and I'd never get divorced because I would never put my kids through what I went through. And unfortunately, one of the byproducts of that is you start to become focused on the, the, the end goal. It was all about getting married and, and having, starting a family. But I never stopped to wonder what that really looked like or what I wanted out of a relationship or what I wanted out of, you know, out of my life. So it became about I've got to I've got to meet someone who will marry me, who will, you know, put up with me, <laughs> so to speak, you know, because I had such low self-esteem. I had so many issues with my anxiety that I had to find someone that essentially wouldn't leave. And unfortunately, and, you know, I my ex-wife and I, we have a much better relationship now. We were together for a very, very long time. And. It, it became kind of a codependent relationship over the years. You know, we both had issues that we needed to deal with that we couldn't deal with. And we were together for a very long time, but we weren't happy for a very long time. And we couldn't, we couldn't do the work that we needed to do in the relationship, unfortunately. And eventually it, it, it led to the end of the relationship. We have two amazing children together. We co-parent. We actually live in the same town. And, you know, the kids get the school bus from both. We have a joint custody. And, you know, we, ha we have a, a much better relationship than today than we did probably when we were married. You know, because we, we've, ch we've both changed a lot. But I came to a realization that, our, our relationship was broken to a point where I, we didn't know how to fix it. And again, kind of going through that exercise of, 
of looking at my daughter and saying, if she came to me, what advice would I give her? Here I was married with two children in the exact same place my parents were and essentially looking at it and saying, the only way this gets fixed, the only way we get better is through separating because we can't, we've tried and we can't fix this together. So essentially I had to become the one thing I swore I would never become in order to find my courage. You've, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Did you have an, another nope. thought to finish there? <laughs> I wanted to give you room to find the words. No, it you know, it's it's hard, it's hard for me because sometimes everything you want is just on the out, on the other side of your comfort zone. Yeah. And the relationship because even though it was bad was comfortable. We had become comfortable, hmm. but we were comfortable in our own problems. And when, when I thought about my, my children, I decided that the only way that, that I could be a good father to them was to not be a bad husband. And, you know, I ended up making the decision to end the relationship, which was the most difficult decision that I've ever made in my life. But... I know now in looking back that that was the best decision I could have made at the time with the tools that I had of being the person that I was and it was absolutely the right decision and I'm a much better father for doing that. I'm a much better husband with with my my wife because of everything that I went through. You know, there's there's a there's a grace that you find at rock bottom and I completely hit it. You know, I went from being married with two kids, you know, high, college sweethearts, everyone thought we were the couple and within a very short period of time I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor of a one bedroom apartment and I was working three jobs <laughs> to try to make it all work. And but I was doing so much work on myself at the time and I had started to, you know, this was a couple of years now after my daughter was born and I started to really look at myself very differently and I started doing a lot of work internally. And, you know, when you do that, it churns up a lot of stuff. And one of the biggest challenges with making change is that things can't stay the same. And I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with when they look to try to make changes in their life is they want something to change. They're not happy where they are. But if you ask them what they're willing to give up, they're not willing to give up anything. And that's the stumbling block for most people. They don't want to change. They don't want to give up. They don't want to make decisions differently or stop doing the things that they're doing, but they're unhappy. Well, the actions that you take is what that's what dictates the course of your life. You have to make, take new action in order to create a new life, and that's painful. And you have to be comfortable with who you are and have confidence in yourself to be able to be willing to do those things that are scary. So, you know, going back to your earlier question about the things that I started to do to face those fears, my entire life became the act of facing those fears. Because up until that point, my entire life was spent hiding from those fears of being held captive of every decision. You know, we make we make decisions from one of two places, from a place of love or a place of fear. And my entire life, I had been making decisions from a place of fear. And it got me to a point where I just was not happy. And, you know, and I needed to make a change. And that's what I started doing. And it was terrifying. Steve, you've used the term my anxiety several times in our discussion, naturally. I'm curious how you can summarize that, though, and to give context. I'm presupposing that some people are going to find us that also are struggling in their own way. 
Mm -hmm. And there is the Oxford Dictionary definition of all of these terms and things that we go through. Mm -hmm. And then is there is our own unique human experience of these things. When you say something like anxiety as it relates and related to your experience, what do you mean? Well, I was actually diagnosed with uh, generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. So I struggled with the best way to explain it is so think about when you were in school and you'd have a big test and you would feel anxious about how you might do on the test. You had to study and you kind of got those butterflies in your stomach and you were worried about whether you were going to do well or not do well. And then the test would come and then whether you passed or failed, there was this relief that set in that, you know, oh, it's finally behind me. Well, when you suffer from a disorder, I mean, it's a it's a mental disorder. When you suffer from an anxiety disorder, you have that butterflies, uncomfortable feeling before a test, but there's no test. You feel that way from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed, and then you struggle to sleep because your mind just races. You know, my mind, the way my brain processed things, it was like a radio that had been left on in a room. And I think a lot of people struggle with this. It's, it's very common for people to have very active minds. I mean, our, our, the, there's a default mode in our brain that actually says when you're not thinking about something specific, we're just going to mull around and kick, kick ideas around and, and work out things subconsciously. And for someone with anxiety, all of those thoughts that run through your head are all negative ones. They're all fear-based. And then you become fixated on that fear. And over time, they grow and they get more and more prevalent in your life. And eventually what happened with me, I, I actually developed a panic disorder. So I started having panic attacks. And my first panic attack happened, my first real professional job interview. I went in. It was, it was something that I had no business going in. <laughs> it, was for, it, it was at an ad agency. I had a fine arts portfolio, you know, I took oil painting and sculpture and, and I went in to this little ad agency in, in New Hampshire and they were looking for an entry level position for a designer. I had no marketing. I didn't know how to use computers. You know, I knew nothing. This was, you know, this was 20 odd years ago. So it's a little bit different. We not, we didn't, not everyone had a computer, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. 25 years ago. So I went in and as I sat down and I started having this job interview, she started talking and asking me questions. The little voice, that little radio in my head got really, really loud. And it was, you know, what, what if, you know, what are you doing here? You can't get this job. They're never going to hire you. And I started to get really uncomfortable. And what I know now, it's that, you know, the, you, everyone talks about the fight or flight mechanism. You know, your, your body goes into that you know, I'm either going to have to fight my way out of this or I need to run. You know, it's this fear based. And that happened. And what happened is I started sweating and I got very uncomfortable. And it was incredibly embarrassing because the, the woman conducting the interview, she, I mean, she could see I was literally and I don't mean like a like a little bead of sweat. I mean, like <laughs> like I had been out running a marathon, like just a flop sweat. I was just completely soaked. And she thought I was going to pass out. I was pale and and from that moment on, I started to worry about having panic attacks all the time. And panic attacks are brought on through the fear of essentially having panic attacks. So they become self-fulfilling prophecies. So I started having panic attacks all the time. So the more that happened, the more I started to withdraw. So for me, my anxiety was completely – it was a full-on mental disorder – that took a hold of my life and really started making all of the decisions for me. And, you know, I've got tons of stories of being in, in work environments where, you know, it reached a point where I started, I started calling out from work when we would have big meetings because I couldn't, I couldn't be in a room with, with more than a couple of people. Eventually it got to a point where you know, even just one on one meetings, I if I started to get uncomfortable and the idea popped into my head that I might have a panic attack, I would have one. And there there 
very uncomfortable. They're very embarrassing. And it's hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with them because a lot of people, you know, the response is usually, well, just don't think about it or, you know, oh, don't be so, you know, don't worry so much. And it's such you, you go into autopilot. So it's hard to control when the subconscious part of your brain kicks in. You know, it's sort of like that. Don't think of the purple elephant. You know, when the idea pops into your head, it's like, you know, that's how that's what a lot of the anxiety and, and the panic disorder was like. And that completely took hold. And right up until the point that my daughter was born, I was struggling with these panic attacks on a weekly, if not daily basis. And, and it, it dictated everything that I did. So when I talk about the anxiety that I felt, I'm talking, you know, clinically, you know, from, from a, from a mental disorder standpoint. And that's one of the things that really has, has pushed me in the past few years to get out and, and talk to people and share my story about dealing with and overcoming anxiety and panic attacks. And, you know, because there's a stigma attached to mental disorders where, and especially with men, we don't want to talk about it because we think we have to be tough. We think we have to, you know, be this uber macho. And, you know, my dad, my dad, who was my hero growing up, was that uber macho. You know, he was he was a police officer. He did construction. You know, he rode a motorcycle. I always joke like had he been in the Navy, he would have been like the village people all in one. You know, the macho man guy. He, he and I wanted to live up to that. But, you know, I was this kind of quiet, sensitive kid who liked to draw. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't that macho kid. I didn't think I could do that. And it just kind of played on those insecurities. And, you know, it, being vulnerable takes a strength that most people don't realize. So to talk about and to stand up and say, I suffered with a mental disorder you know, you're walking directly into a stigma that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with. And for me, when I started becoming more open as part of my facing my fears and really putting myself out there, the response I got was amazing because I started having all these people come up to me and say, first off, they would say, I had no idea you, you went through that. From the outside, no one, you couldn't tell. And secondly, I had people coming up saying, I go through the exact same thing and I thought I was alone. And there, it, there's over 40 million people in the US who struggle with some form of anxiety disorder and they all feel completely alone because it's something we're not, com we're not comfortable talking about mental disorders. And so my hope is to kind of break some of that stigma and, and talk about it and make it okay for, for people and men to, to come forward and talk about this type of stuff because there is a strength that is required to do that. I couldn't agree with you more, Steve. I absolutely could not agree with you more. I want to go back to the point that you described a few minutes ago where your first marriage had, had then separated at least, but the process that you described a while back about seeing your daughter and evaluating yourself and even considering the idea that you might be able to find that same goodness inside yourself that you perceived your daughter to have. But now you're off on your own. And you, the phrase that you used, I wrote it down. You said you were doing so much work on yourself or you said on myself. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What, what kind of work were you doing? Well, the easiest way to sum, to sum it up was I was doing, I was taking the negative thoughts and I was replacing them with positive ones. See, I came to, I came to a, a realization, and I don't think it's anything new, but for me, when you, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, hmm. you know, I, I, I came to the realization that every, everything's a, a flip of the coin. It could be just as positive as it could turn out negative. So instead of constantly telling myself all the time it was going to turn out poorly, what would happen if I started telling myself it would turn out well. So I went through the process. I, I literally wrote out a list of all my negative thinking, all the things that I could think of that were, were negative. And next to each one, I wrote a replacement thought, a positive one. And I started 
actively practicing telling myself positive things instead of negative ones. And most people have no idea what kind of influence they have over their own lives based on whether they are talking to themselves in a positive way or a negative way. Our inner voice, our inner dialogue, it's, you know, it's like having, I always say that I had the world's worst life coach in my head for the majority of my life, you know, and, and I think uh, that's what I'm going to call this episode, by the way. (laughs) World's Worst Life Coach with Steve Zanella. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Sorry. That won't won't help the business much, but... (laughs) No, it might might make people curious. I know that headlines is an area where I've got to get better. I apologize. I just... I couldn't couldn't resist cannonballing in on you on that one. So you had... You had the what? But how did you know to do that, though? And maybe you knew how to do this yourself. I'm hearing this, of course, through my own filter of of my experience, and know how those kinds of things needed to be introduced to me because what you're describing was absolutely foreign to me, and I needed to be coached. How did you know to start doing those kinds of things? Well, it was it was a combination of a lot of things. You know, I started doing a lot of research. I started. Uh, Googling everything. I started reaching out to people. I, I, I eventually went out and I got myself a therapist. Um, it was something I had seen a therapist when I was much younger. I, I got involved with a therapist during my first marriage. I attempted to get us into couples therapy, which didn't work. Um, didn't work in terms of we never made it there. Um, and so I just, it was for me, it became about education. I had to start learning about what was going on. I had to understand what was going on in my head. And I I gave up to the process. I literally said, you know, I I think of I think of I'm I was a big Jerry Seinfeld fan <laughs> and George Costanza, there was an episode where You're going to say the opposite, aren't you? The opposite, yes, absolutely. He started saying, you know, I'm just going to do the exact opposite of what I think I should do. And his life completely turns around and, you know, he gets the job and the girl. And and then, of course, in only like Costanza could, he messes it all up. But I literally started doing that. I, I just kind of went in and said, everything that I've been doing is wrong. I'm completely miserable. I have everything on my checklist that was supposed to make me happy and I'm miserable. I was an alcoholic. I've been sober now for five years. I, I couldn't, part of the anxiety, part of the coping mechanism was my alcoholism. You know, I would use alcohol for courage. I couldn't go out socially unless I had a few drinks because I was so amped up about panic attacks and anxiety that I would use the alcohol to take the edge off. But, you know, I, I so I started doing as much research as I could. And I said, you know what, I need to figure this out. And again, it was the why was my daughter. I looked at it and I said, if I don't get a handle on this, if I don't figure this out, I'm not I'm going to be no good to her. So I, I did as much research as I could. And I eventually started seeing a therapist. And, you know, some of the things that I was already doing, the therapist was able to kind of put a name and practice to some of it and say, well, apparently this is what therapists do. And I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing that. So I, I guess I'm on the right track. Um, and, and I just, I, I started, you know, we, we live in a great time right now where we're in this age of information where if you are willing to do the work, you can learn anything. You know, I, I actually, you know, I work in higher education and I understand that, you know, People, especially in the U.S., people pay a lot of money to, to earn a degree. But the education is free. It's out there. Anyone, anyone with a library card can go. <laughs> anyone with an internet connection can Google and can – I mean a lot of colleges actually put their stuff online for free. You don't get the degree, but you can learn the knowledge. And if you're willing to learn and do the work, you can teach yourself anything. So I literally just – like put myself into school about figuring out my brain and anxiety and how to fix things and how to, and I started, uh, you know, I like moved into the self-help section at Barnes and Noble and I just started (laughs) buying every book that I could and, you know, anything from Tony Robbins and Dr. Wayne Dyer and, and then 
I, I stumbled across, it's funny, I found a friend of mine posted a video of, of Jim Carrey, the comedian, and I absolutely love Jim Carrey. And he, it was something that he was at the podium and he, he was giving this really deep, meaningful speech. And he was actually, um, he was introducing uh, Eckhart Tolle at a conference. And I had never heard of Eckhart Tolle. And I went out and I looked him up. I said, all right, well, I'm going to figure out what this is about. So I Googled him and I found out a bunch of stuff in The Power of Now. And I went out and I got that book. So I just started this process of really digging deep, of being willing to, to essentially you know, experiment on myself and say, nothing's working, so I have to do something different, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's kind of how I started making these steps and, and making these leaps forward. And it, it just it took me down this rabbit hole that completely changed my entire life. If every one of your natural instincts is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The, um, you know, and when you said about how you can learn how to do anything, you literally can learn how to be happy if you decide you want to, can't you? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. But I think the challenge for most people is they don't understand that they have a lot of that control. Mm -hmm. Most people, myself included, feel like life pushes them around. And they have to understand that they can take control back. They can grab the wheel and start directing their life. But it's a lot of work and their sacrifice. And it's difficult sometimes. But it's also amazing and rewarding and and life altering in such a positive way. But we get stuck, you know, we're, there's such a societal pressure to conform in a certain way that I don't think people are fully comprehending how sort of programmed they become. We, you know, I mean, you think about the moment we're born, we're given a name, we're given a religion, we're given a, a history, and most people spend the rest of their lives defending that story. And depending on where in the world you're born, you get a completely different reality handed to you. And at some point, when you start really looking at these things, you start to realize that they're all stories and you can change them. You can rewrite that story and you can start to look at things and question things. You know, I, part of the work that I do is I approach everything like a toddler, my youngest. So I, right now I have a 10 year old an eight year old and a two year old. And my youngest Camden is hysterical and he's entered the why phase of being two. Why? 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 I channel my inner toddler with everything that I do now and I question why. Why do I feel this way? Why am I thinking this? Why do I have that belief? Is it a belief worth keeping? Should I challenge it? I spend a lot of time researching the other side of things that I believe and really being willing to challenge myself and say, I don't have to have the answers. I have to be willing to question what I believe. And I think, again, a lot of people struggle with that because they, their reality is the foundation on which they build their entire life. And if you start picking away at that foundation, it puts the entire structure in jeopardy. And most people are so connected with that structure, with the life that they've built, that the idea of deconstructing it is the scariest thing in the world. And they're, they, they're more willing to stay miserable and they're more willing to defend ideas and beliefs that no longer serve them than they are willing to challenge that foundation and, and possibly pull things apart in their own life. Steve, what are some of the moments and feelings that you can recall as we're sitting here talking together? When you began to become aware of 
I don't want to say happiness so much. That sounds kind of glib, but I'm guessing that you know where I'm going here. That uh, that after all of those years and all that collective experience and all of the the layers and the the piling on of the muck and the crap and the anxiety and the dark thoughts and the alcohol and the panic attacks and all of that. What was it like when you first began to become aware of going, whoa, things are actually starting to change for the better here. What was that like for you? It was surprising it was amazing. It was, uh, I, I approached it with a kind of a wow. You know, I think, I think Oprah coins the aha moment. You know, I had, I don't know how many aha moments in my life. It seemed like they were happening daily. And it, I, it transformed me in such a way that I started looking at things and saying, okay, how can I challenge this? Okay, how can I change this? Or how can I fix this and I it opened up everything suddenly became an opportunity you know when I mentioned it before you know when the when the student is ready the teacher appears I always I always had in the back of my mind that that meant you know, like literally someone would appear to teach you something like you'd find a mentor or something but what I now realize is that when you reach that point of looking at the world through this lens everything becomes a teacher There is opportunity to learn in every moment that you have from the moment you wake up in the morning, the way I approach, you know, my alarm clock, the way I approach my morning, the way I approach my drive to work, you know, being here, interacting with everybody, everything's a teachable moment. Everything is an opportunity to create something amazing from whether you choose to smile at the person, you know, at the drive through getting a coffee or whether someone says something that irritates you and makes you angry or annoyed or someone, you know, flips you off in traffic. You know, when I get angry, which I still do, I still get angry, I pause and I recognize the feeling that I'm having and I say, where is that coming from? And that's like it's become this great moment for me because I feel like when I have a strong shift in emotion – that's telling me that there's something there that I can work on. Almost like, you know, it, it, you, you almost get addicted to the process. That's awesome. I'm angry. Where, <laughs> where is this anger coming from? You know, so everything becomes an opportunity. And it, it really comes down to, you know, developing the past, you know, the past five years, I've done a lot with meditation and I practice mindfulness. And that has been, truly, you know, a a game changer for me in regards to being able to open up and being more self-aware of myself and other people and seeing things, recognizing things that are going on from a very new perspective. And I approach, you know, I approach everything as a lesson, as an opportunity. And, you know, I, I believe we're here to have fun and we're here to create and build these amazing lives and we just have to figure out how to do that. You know, there's there's strategies everywhere, but we don't apply them. And I'm I'm all about applying them and seeing what happens. You know, testing it and then adjusting it and seeing and be but being honest because now now that I'm in a much better place where you know I truly love who I am, I can fail. Failure is awesome because that puts me one step closer to success. And every great person that has accomplished anything of value has failed more times than they've succeeded. And but you have to have you have to have that love and confidence in yourself first to get over the fear of what if I fail? Now I look at it and go, you know, what can I fail at next? Because I know that there's success on the other side of it. I just have to get through the failures first. And sometimes I don't fail, and that's awesome too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you might surprise yourself. Exactly. And, yeah, but you won't get either result if you just sort of stay where you are and sit back and, and wait for life just to to happen to you. Um, Absolutely. So, Steve, some of the things then that you 
are creating and are looking to express and are looking to try and fail and succeed at, what are some of the things now that are, are kind of simmering that you're developing in ways that you're looking to show up in the world and, and things that you're, you're doing and, and aspire to do more of as you go forward from here? Well, I'm, uh, I'm just finishing. I'm in the editing process of my first book called The Anxiety Dharma. And it is essentially a collection of the observations and the things that I've experienced and learned and tried over the past 10 years. It's sort of a collection of different stories of how I ended up with the anxiety that I had, how I started to work through it, and then lessons and different things that, that I've learned that my hope, my hope right now is that I can help as many people as I possibly can. You know, I, I, I truly believe that to receive you have to give and a life of service and helping others. I was in such a dark place and I didn't think I could get out and I know that there are millions of people who are in that place right now who don't believe they can get out. If I can help them realize that there's a chance that you can get out, that it's possible, I, I wanna reach out to them. I wanna do as much as that as much as I can. This past year has been you know, a lot of fun for me because I've gotten really excited about sharing this and I've started doing more public speaking in regards to anxiety and meditation and mindfulness and kind of just putting an everyday man spin on it because so many people are, there's, you know, this sort of woo woo meditation, mindfulness has become a buzzword, but no one really knows what it is or, you know, they always think it's something outside of themselves or, something that you have to study, you know, shave your head and be a monk on a mountaintop or something like that. And it's really, it's so much more practical than that. And my hope is that if I can use my story and use my example to help other people start down their path, because all I can do is share my story and put it out there. I can't walk the walk for anyone, just the same way no one could walk the walk for me. I had to come to these realizations myself. I had to take these steps and take action. You know, at some point, you have to stop reading all of the books and you have to close them and then you have to put them into practice in your daily life. And that's the scary part. You know, buying the self-help book and, and you know, reading about how to do something is one thing. Actually taking the, the steps and applying the actions that's a whole other ball game, and I think that that's really where people get hung up again because there's this this anxiety and fear. Even if you don't suffer from an anxiety disorder like I did, most people they're so afraid of pushing that envelope that you know sometimes they need to see that we are all capable of greatness. Every single person, no matter who you are, where you're born, what your situation is. You can, you can achieve anything that you set your mind to. It's just a matter of learning how to reframe how your mind looks at these challenges and how you take action to achieve them. It's got to be exciting having the, the book on the horizon. And I like the title, Anxiety Dharma. It doesn't ring quite as well as World's Worst Life Coach. but <laughs> Maybe that'll but be a subtitle. Maybe, yeah, maybe you <laughs> Maybe you can pass it through another editor. Just a gentle <laughs> suggestion for you there, Steve. No, that's uh, – I'm guessing that the book in itself has been just that alone, an incredible journey and um, I'm thinking a gargantuan effort in terms of building the discipline to continue to come back to it day after day, week after week, month after month. It's, it's probably been a long process. It, it has, but it's been a very rewarding one. You know, it, it started with um, blog posts a few years ago. You know, like I had said earlier where I started changing the way I interacted on social media, I started to challenge myself to share more of my story and put myself out there a lot more. So I had started a blog and I started kind of jotting down thoughts and ideas and sharing them with, with friends and family, you know, where I think most people start with these things. 
And I started, you know, I started getting a very positive response. But what I found is it, the journaling process allowed me to deal with and process a lot of ideas and thoughts in my own head that helped me move forward. And, you know, even today I do, you know, I do a grat- a, a quick gratitude journal every morning where I wake up and one of the first things that I do in my morning routine is to write down three things that I'm grateful for. Because if you start your day with gratitude, you are setting yourself off on, on, in the right direction. So just the process of writing these things down and starting to understand how you can write your life and figure things out. And, and it forces you to think about things very differently when you commit to putting, you know, pen to paper, which I, which I actually do when I do journaling is I write pen to paper. I'm writing my book on the computer, but I like the act of, of writing longhand because it, it interacts parts of your brain that are, are different, you know, that, that it just engages you a little bit differently, especially with me with anxiety, you know, getting out of the emotional part of my brain and into the more, you know, front part where it's a little more focused, um, that helps a lot. So, you know, I, I love journaling. I love writing this stuff down. So the book sort of became an extension and then the talking, because again, when you have anxiety, I mean, one of the biggest fears everyone talks about is, is public speaking. So there's probably nothing worse for someone who suffers from anxiety than the idea of standing on stage (laughs) in front of, you know, hundreds of people and telling them your worst fears, exposing yourself, you know, in a way that, you know, really puts you at risk of of being judged. But there's also an excitement behind it that, you know, I always tell people that it's about changing your relationship with fear because you're never going to get away. You're never going to completely eradicate fear. You know, we need a certain amount of fear is healthy. It keeps us alive, you know, but having that anxiety, anxiety and excitement oftentimes feel very, very similar. And when you hide from the feeling of anxiety, you tend to hide from the feeling of excitement as well. So it's all in the way that you process it and how you, you know, re reshape it in your mind and how you approach it in every day. So, you know, I, I, I just recently spoke um, at a college at a conference about meditation and mindfulness. And I've done a lot of work to try to figure out how to get more comfortable speaking in public. And I had this, you know, epiphany, which probably isn't an epiphany to most people who who do a lot of public speaking. But when I thought about myself and whether I was going to do well, I got nervous. But when I thought about the value I could bring to the people listening, it became about them and the nerves went away. And I was like, huh, okay. So that's another way of looking at it and saying, what value can I bring? How do I, how do I give as much as I can? So, you know, I, I, I created a Facebook page for people who struggle with anxiety where it's a closed group where people can, can come in and I, we have conversations and I post Facebook live videos and I talk about anxiety and people can ask questions and, you know, we just kind of help each other because a a lot of, a lot of anxiety sites, they, they tend to be people complaining a lot about the anxiety that they have, but there aren't a lot of solutions. And I wanted to create a space where people were being given solutions, you know, where it was again, more positive, just starting where I started with learning to, to be a little bit more positive and changing that mindset just a little bit to start pushing things in the right direction. For somebody that's listening to this that is struggling in their own way or knows somebody that who is and would like to reach out to and, and connect to you, maybe even be a part of that community, what would you encourage them to do, Steve? Um, they can come to my website, stevezanella.com. All of my social media links are there, and they can... I, I put up a little ebook that they can download for free and read about, you know, five of the first things that I started doing to overcome my anxiety and they can connect with me there. My email, you know, I have Steve at stevesanella.com. I always give it out to anyone, anyone who wants to reach out to me. I always answer my emails and respond to every single person that reaches out because I, I think it's so important. You know, I feel so much passion with connecting with others and reaching out to try to give back to help as many people as I can so that 
you know, they can learn that they can change their life and, you know, create amazing things. And it's just, it's going to be a ripple effect because it not only impacts you, but it impacts all of the people around you. You know, my children are now learning about, you know, being more confident and, you know, meditation and understanding how their brains work and how to process things and approach challenges differently. And I can show them through example because I've done the work and I figured it out myself. And that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. And I want to help as many other people as I can do that. Isn't it amazing too, Steve, just to wrap up that you can spend so much time with everything feeling so wrong and shrinking back into that emotional and, and physical shell. And then once you start to, all the way back to where we started an hour ago, just make that first brave step to, to push back, which is as simple as a thought, as even asking what if. Is it even possible for me to be able to turn this around and be happy? That as that starts to, to expand, then other people start to be drawn into your path. You know, even where geography is, is a complete challenge, like every time I have a conversation like this with somebody that I didn't know previously, I sit here in awe thinking, how is it among the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Twitter tweeters and whatever else that you and I found our way onto each other's paths and have had this time to connect and to share in an effort to help each other and to help somebody else. And for me that's 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 when you feel like if if life was you know the wave you're up on the surfboard and you're really riding it mm -hmm. you know because you're just creating those experiences and you're and you're going with and beside somebody else in a genuine effort to um, empower each other and and other people and I just think it's really, really cool. And um, I'm, I'm proud of, of you. I'm, I'm proud of myself, quite frankly. And if anybody that's taken the time to listen to this, I hope that they'll reach out to you or to me or to both and, uh, and do what you did. But Steve, I, I congratulate you and I wish you all the best of success and consider me a supporter and a friend and a brother to, to support you however I possibly can. But I'm just really grateful for this time and want to thank you very sincerely. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to have had a chance to, to get on it and talk to you. You know, I've been listening to your podcast and, you know, you, you have a way of connecting with people and the work that you're doing is, is, is incredible, you know, reaching out to people and, and using technology to bring people together and connect people from all over the world is amazing. So you should be proud of the work that you're doing because it, it helps so many people. And like I said, I'm completely honored and humbled to have to have been included on your podcast. Oh, one last thing. The jerk store called. They're running out of you. <laughs> no? <laughs> you're telling me you're a Jerry Seinfeld fan and that one went by you? <laughs> that one went right by me. <laughs> jerk store. Jerk store is the line. All right, I got to think of something else. All right, I'm going to let you go so that you can go get some Kenny Rogers chicken. How's that? Oh, perfect. That one better? <laughs> that one's much better. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have pulled out the jerk store line without knowing exactly what episode that was from. But when, <laughs> when they're arguing about what's when somebody insults you and you wish that you had the best comeback and you can't think of it until like a day later. And George <laughs> thinks that this the, his insult is that he should have said to this guy is the jerk store called and they're running out of you. And everybody else is wondering, you know, what in the world did that mean? So. I must have just given you a moment thinking, boy, that was really an about face that Bulmer just pulled on me there. <laughs> I was waiting for a buddy of mine to be like, ah, oh, there's no podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm just making a note here. I'm just writing in big letters jerk store because I've got to, uh, I, I got to find that on YouTube and post that with our blog. <laughs> Either that or remember how I told you before we started recording that we could always clip something out. At, there you uh, go. Anyway, Steve, thanks so much. It's uh, It's been a blast and I look forward to many more conversations down the road. Absolutely. I look forward to it as well. You can connect with Steve online at his official website at stevezanella.com. Steve is S-T-E-V-E, and Zanella is Z if you're in the United States, Z if you're in Canada, eh? And then A-N-E 
L L A. So S T E V E Z Z A N E L L A. Steve Zanella. Dot com. He also gave out his email address. If you're struggling with anxiety and you're looking for some help, you can reach out to Steve at Steve at SteveZanella.com. He's got a Facebook page as well, Facebook.com slash Steve Zanella Face Your Fear. Now, as he mentioned, he's also got a private Facebook group that you can go on there and you can make a request. You can sign up to contact Steve and request to join that group if you'd like to be a part of that community. If you're struggling with anxiety like Steve was, I would strongly suggest that you put yourself as part of a support group like that because you're going to get some 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 great support from like-minded people that are looking to improve their life and want to encourage you to do the same. So you can do that on Facebook with Steve. On Twitter, you can reach out to him at SC Zanella. Same on Instagram, instagram.com at SC Zanella and he's got a YouTube channel as well if you go on there and search out his name Steve Zanella you'll find him I'll put the link to his um, to his YouTube channel up on the show notes blog post page as well oh also Snapchat I don't think about that as as readily because I'm not on there at least not yet Uh, but at SC Zanella on Snapchat if you use that you can find him there Keep in mind, you can download his ebook, Five Steps to Help You Overcome Anxiety, at his website at stevezanella.com. You can do that for free. Now, if you liked this episode with Steve, you'll probably enjoy these ones. Episode 40 is called Learning to Love Yourself with Katie Kozlowski. Katie went through some really difficult times before she finally got to a point, and it arrived in quite an interesting way a collision with a taxi cab in New York City. We actually start the conversation with that story. It's episode 40 of the No Schedule Man podcast, Learning to Love Yourself with Katie Kozlowski. I'm not sure I finished the thought that I just started, that when that collision with the taxi cab happened, that was the precipitation of her making a choice to live her life in a different way and really improve it going forward. And I think you'll relate to that if you could relate to Steve. Another one, episode 23, my friend Sue Kerr, Let me try and say that again. Sue Kerr, fear less and live more. Sue has a great message regarding taking control of your fear and empowering yourself. And way back at episode 12, when I got to talk to Jason Stevenson from MeditationMasters.tv and Relax Me Online, it's called The Spirit of Giving and The Power to Change. Jason has a really, really popular YouTube guided meditation channel, sleep music, meditation music. But Jason had just an awful time of it going through his 30s. And he describes that in a really raw and a really honest fashion and also tells the tale about what it was that got him to change and what were some of the things that he did in that time and and in the time since. Really powerful stuff. That's at episode 12 from Jason Stevenson. And by the way, his guided meditations and the, the music and the other products that he has available absolutely for free on his YouTube channel. If you just search Jason Stevenson, that will help you if you're struggling with anxiety. That's how I found out about him to begin with because I use those tools to help me out of those dark times too. You can find all of those and all archived episodes at noschedulemanpodcast.com or on iTunes. And you can reach out to me at kevinbolmer.com, noschedulemancom will take you to the same place. All my social media channel links are listed up there on the upper right-hand side, as is the sign-up for our email list. I do hope you'll join me on this journey, and please do add your voice to mine. I'm going to take a little bit of a break next week, but we'll be back with a new episode a couple of weeks from now. I hope you'll join me then for another journey on the No Schedule Man podcast. Thanks for listening. Just a little deja vu. 